My name is Jim Anderson, and I lead the Government Innovation, City Innovation Programs at the Bloomberg Foundation uh, out of New York City. I want to thank the Milken Institute and the Center for the Future of Aging for having all of us here today. Uh, welcome to all of you. I think we're going to have an awesome conversation um, with a really tremendous panel. I'm going to set just a little bit of context. Um, uh, share a few statistics, and then we're going to get right into the meat of the discussion. So number one, this year, for the first time in human history, we will have more people over the age of 65 than we have under the age of five. Statistic number two, in the 20th century alone, an extra 30 years of life were added to millions of people's lives, which is just stunning to think about. Here in the States, the share of the population 65 plus is currently at about 15%. That's going to be 21% within the next decade. And by 2060, a full quarter of the US population will be over 65 years old. Here in Los Angeles, we may be at the epicenter of this shift. Over these 20 years, the local population over 65 will double from 1.1 million to 2.1 million. For me, working in the sort of civic innovation space, I look at all of those statistics as an incredibly exciting opportunity. I think this is going to be an area where we will see some of the most dynamic policy making and robust and exciting civic innovation out there. Um, and, and we will really need to. These challenges will ask us to reconsider what we mean by s senior services, our systems of mobility, our, the decisions we make around our built environment, and our civic spaces. They will stress local governments, cash-strap local governments, and stress systems of long-term care and health provision. And they will also create extraordinary opportunities for social innovation, uh, for entrepreneurship, and for intergenerational mixing in the way that we think about our programs and our civic spaces. So there's so much excitement and change ahead. So much of that will fall on the shoulders of civic leaders. In the states, 80% of the American population already lives in cities big and small. Globally, 54% of the population is affected by policies that are created by mayors. In the next 20 years, that will move to 70%. So the question that we'll be looking at today is, how do we imagine a different policy response, a more robust policy response that enables people of all ages to live more fully, healthfully, and engaged in their communities over the long term? And how do we increase the ambition of our civic leaders in the here and now so that we can begin thinking about these changes today um, at the level of urgency and at the scale that we really need, um, given the size and scope of the challenge ahead? So we have awesome experts uh, who are going to help us get at some answers. I'm going to start uh, to the far, to my far right, not to the far right, uh, with Dan Buettner, uh, who is, uh, as many politically. people, <laughs> uh, an explorer, an award-winning journalist and producer, a best-selling author. Many of you are familiar with his groundbreaking work around blue zones. These are places where people live the longest, healthiest lives. I'm excited about the fact that he's now taking all of the lessons from that research and bringing them into a local policy-making context. So Dan, your, your research uh, reveals a recipe, I think you call it the Power Nine, um, that you believe all of us could adapt. Um, briefly tell us what's in the Power Nine. So I have four slides, if they could pull up the first slide. So when I think about aging, uh, my approach is, in a sense, to reverse engineer longevity or good aging. So with National Geographic, I worked with a team of demographers to identify the five parts of the world where people live statistically longest, which really means that they're making it to age mid-90s, um, and they're doing so without chronic disease, and they're living well. And uh, we found five of them. Longest lived, women, longest lived women in the world lived in Okinawa, Japan. Longest lived men in the highlands of Sardinia. On the island of Ikaria, you have a population of 10,000 people who largely don't get dementia. They're also living eight years longer. In Latin America, it's the Nicoya Peninsula, a place where um, uh, people have the lowest rate of middle age mortality. In other words, they have the best chance of reaching a healthy age 90. And they do so spending 1 15th the amount we do on health care in this country. And then in the United States, it's among the Seventh-day Adventists, who are conservative Methodists, who strict Adventists are living 10 years longer than the rest of us. 
If you go to the next slide, I'll show you the sort of power nine. So no matter where you go in the world and you see long-lived people, you see the same not common denominators. And I'm not going to go through all of those, but I'd like to point out a few that are germane to this discussion. Uh, first of all, they don't exercise. You never see people pumping iron running triathlons. <laughs> Uh, they live in places where every time they go to work or to a friend's house or their kids go to school, it occasions a walk. Their houses aren't full of mechanical conveniences, so they're doing so much more by hand. They have gardens. Uh, th so the big point, they live in very walkable communities. And in many of them, uh, uh, every place you go, it's a, it's a walk uphill. Oh, when you do a meta-analysis of all the longevity diets in the world, you see the same common denominators. Number one, about 95% of what they consume are whole plant-based foods. They do eat meat about five times per month on average, but there are four foods, four food groups you see in every blue zone. Um, greens, whole grains, nuts, and beans. If you're eating about a cup of beans a day, it's probably adding about four years of extra life to your life expectancy. Um, they celebrate age. Uh, we live in a place where we tend to celebrate youth. You know, social equity peaks at about age 30. In blue zones, uh, the older you get, the more celebrated you are. And in many places, uh, Okinawa specifically, their vocabulary does not include the word retirement. Instead, they use the word ikigai, the reason for which I wake up in the morning, to imbue their entire adult life. If you can go to the next slide. So th the lessons we learn here is people in the blue zones they don't do any of the stuff we do to pursue healthy aging. They don't get on diets. They don't buy an elliptical for their basement. They don't call an 800 number for a supplement. Uh, they, to use this, uh, they eat wisely, plant-based. They move about every 20 minutes. They're nudged into movement, gentle, low-intensity physical activity. Because, because their life is underpinned with purpose, they have small social networks that encourage the right behavior, and then they live in places where the healthy choice is the easy choice, and I hope we get to discuss a lot about that. So the secret to longevity is that longevity is never successfully pursued. We are never gonna get 330 million Americans to change their behavior for long enough to avoid a chronic disease. It successfully ensues. And that's the big paradigm shift, that when we think about healthy aging, we need to think about how we shape our city so the healthy choice is the easy choice. And it's really this interconnected cluster of behaviors, this sort of scaffolding, this mutually supporting web that it keeps people doing the right things for long enough and not doing the wrong things so that they're developing cardiovascular disease and cancer and, and, and uh, dementia in many cases. And then the, so based on this, uh, for the last 10 years, if we go to the next slide, and this is the last slide, uh, we developed a model for cities, and we're now in 26 cities. And um, in each of these cities, I hire full-time trained people who uh, belong to one of three squads. The, the first squad on the far right over there is the policy squad. And we have aggregated best practice policies in food, favoring fruits and vegetables over chips, sodas, and junk food built environment favoring the pedestrian and safety over the motorist and favoring the non-smoker over the smoker. And then we come into these cities, we're invited in and we show them these menus and we let them choose from the menu. We don't tell people what to do, a lot like what Bloomberg so brilliantly did in New York City, but instead of having an agenda around one specific, uh, we write a menu and then the cities get, they'll pick what works the best for them and then we just help them achieve it. The second squad administers a Blue Zone certification for schools, restaurants, grocery stores, workplaces, and churches. And over a five-year period, we can usually expect to get 30% of all of those places certified. And then the final squad gets 15% of individuals. There's kind of a tipping point theory at about 15% to optimize their social network, go into their homes with checklists to optimize their homes, and then we put them through a purpose workshop and get them volunteering. One of the best ways, for, I don't care what age you are, 20 or 85, uh, to raise a person's well-being and lower their health care costs and their chance of developing a chronic disease is getting them involved with volunteering. So, but you have to facilitate that. So 
Our biggest city today is uh, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, um, but we also have them in, in uh, Naples, Florida, Los Angeles, California, right here in the beach cities. And in every city we worked in, we've seen the BMI drop. Uh, we've seen well-being go up, smoking drop, and it's working not because we're trying to change behaviors, but because we optimize the environment. A quick follow-up question for you. When you look across that 10 years of experience in those 26 cities, and you think about where you've gotten the, the most traction, what does the constellation look like on the ground, the political constellation? Who's inviting you in in those cases? Yeah, so in every case, they're privately supported, usually by the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan or the hospital system, and they're publicly endorsed. So here's, here's the secret. The secret is before you agree to work in a city, we interview the city manager, the mayor, the city council, the superintendent of schools, the chamber of commerce, and we open the kimono. In a sense, we're trying to reduce their freedoms to do unhealthy things. In the same way, an alcoholic, you want to reduce an al an alcohol's, alcoholic's access to vodka in his kitchen. But we similarly want to do that with an un you know, 70% of these people are unhealthy. So if they start saying right away, well, this sounds nanny state to me, we say, well, you should keep doing what you're doing. So we only work in cities where they want us and they'll actually sign a pledge. So if you can create that sort of political runway ahead of time, they're already nodding your head and making a commitment. You can get a lot done in five years. And by the way, the best, if you want to actually create a healthier America or healthier, healthier city, the best investment, this according to the CDC, is changing policy. Uh, and, and we know the policies that yield lower BMI, that yield more physical activity, that yield more trust, that yield more social cohesiveness. Uh, you just have to get, you just have to find the right cities where there's the political equity and will to focus on those quality of life policies rather than uh, economic development, blind you know, development, which you get a lot of cities, so. Um, next, I'll bring Carol Coletta into the conversation. So uh, Carol uh, currently is the president and CEO of the Memphis River Parks Partnership. She's been a senior fellow at the Kresge Foundation. Carol shows up on any good list of the best urbanists in America, usually towards the top. Um, and she has really been, I think, one of the uh, muses to those of us uh, working in the civic innovation space um, because she has a real bottoms-up um, appreciation of how change happens and has been one of the leaders in articulating the importance of um, with not for um, in the way that we develop um, our spaces, our policies, and the cities in which we live. So Carol, you've worked in tons of cities, uh, some of them very deeply, others uh, through a more national lens at, at the Knight Foundation or at Kresge. So when you think about these demographic shifts and the nature of change that's coming our way, number one, you know, are communities and civic leaders thinking about it at the, in the right way, at the right level? And secondly, what is the opportunity of civic commons in helping mayors move this agenda forward in a more powerful and visible way? <clears throat> if we have to think about it in a segmented way, uh, longevity, or or if, if we're thinking about it in a segmented way in terms of the people, the demographic, then I think mayors and cities are not prepared. But I also think, listening to Dan, for instance, and uh, there are things that are in the mix, thanks in large part to you, your work and your colleagues' work, that are, uh, that very much enable longevity. Um, you know, we about five years ago, uh, we started thinking about the growing inequality in cities and the growing disconnectedness. And we felt that those were a result in part of segregation and segmentation. And segregation, not racial segregation, in fact, we're doing better in America on that, but rather economic segregation and then when you think about segmentation, the fact that, and marketers, of course, have perfected segmentation over many years, this notion of um, we have to work constituency by constituency and do that for one and that for another. And so we, 
which is a very expensive proposition, right, and very long term. So we thought, and, and a power game. So we, we began to ask ourselves, what can you, what are the resources that we have at our fingertips that we could use to re-knit communities across the segregated and the segmented divides? And I think that's where uh, this notion of older adults uh, fit, fit into the equation. And what we found was there was a set of assets uh, across communities. They were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. They were in every neighborhood, rich and poor, uh, that were basically underinvested. And those were our parks, our libraries, our rec centers, um, uh, our pools, our public pools. They were all publicly owned, but they had become disinvested primarily because people with money who could afford to buy those services elsewhere were doing that. Um, and so that left those assets, those civic assets, those public places um, disinvested and, uh, and not imagined for a for a new set of consumer needs and wants uh, and uh, not particularly compelling design-wise, management-wise, operationally for people, again, who could afford to go elsewhere and left the staff pretty dispirited as well. So we began an initiative in five cities called Reimagining the Civic Commons, trying to understand how you could think about those civic assets as a portfolio of assets and how you could begin to manage them, uh, really design, welcome, manage, and program them in a different way toward a different set of outcomes, four different outcomes, one of which specifically was socioeconomic mixing, uh, which runs very counter to the trend. So it's not an easy thing to do, but I think with intention, what we're finding three years later uh, after working in these five cities is that, in fact, you can really make uh, progress if you manage with intention. And you've talked about the, the sort of goal being how do we make it delightful for people of different incomes to get, come together, to, who live near one another, to come and use the same public spaces? Are there lessons that we could apply to this question of age diversity and intergenerational mixing? I, I Very much so. One of the things missing in our public life today is active management and welcome. We, as you well know, there are all sorts of constraints on public employees, uh, not in terms, I think this must be my earring hitting my. Um, That's a good look, by the way. Thank you <laughs> very much. You're going to understand why. I don't want that banging. I think it's this. Um, so uh, we, we're missing management. We think we can't afford it. And when we do have it, it's very no oriented, very risk averse. Um, I, we have to start looking at how a, at active management of public space that welcomes people into the space, manages it again for uh, socioeconomic mixing, and programs it as such. It's interesting, one of the things we're doing as part of this initiative is we're actually managing the proximity of people and people of different demographics. and. Uh, how they start conversations. And we've actually been able to increase proximity, uh, it's conversation distance actually, by 50% uh, by in the spaces that we're managing now in these five cities. And it, which shows me it's not easy, but with intention, I think we can get the mixing that does not normally occur. And I was really interested in your, you know, your, is how do you make the right thing to do the easy thing to do? Uh, how do you how do you underpin the success that you want? How do you engineer uh, re-engineer uh, backwards from the outcomes you're seeking? I just don't think historically we've thought about public space as that, and as a result, we think we have to create all sorts of new assets and new spaces instead of using what we've already invested in, invest a little more, and particularly just reimagine what those can produce for community. And I do believe that um, thinking about them as longevity assets uh, is really important. And I just want to say one more word about this because it's, we, again, we increasingly live in segregated ways, right? We incre increasingly live our lives with people 
who look like us and who are um, who have the same who are at the same life stage. The problem is that's a that's a heck of a challenge then to develop any empathy, uh, any real concern for people we don't see on a regular basis, and this this notion that we're going to isolate older adults or that older adults need to live only around older adults to me uh, diminishes the richness of community and it diminishes our ability to empathize and see ourselves as part of a community that includes who today may be strangers to us. And again, we have to, it, our, our challenge is that we live in ever more segregated ways, which is where we found the public of, uh, the, the power of the public space to bring us together again. Okay. I think that's a great um, uh, opportunity to bring in the mayor of Helsinki, uh, Mayor Jan Vapaviori, uh, who- it's Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Uh, ten times uh, or so from now, maybe I'll get there. But so, um, so it's awesome to be here with the mayor of Helsinki um, for a lot of different reasons. First of all, at Bloomberg, we've gotten to know him really well. He's a participant in a number of our programs, and we've learned as much from that city as hopefully they have learned from the rest of the Bloomberg Cities Network. Um, but I think picking up on some of the points that Carol was raising, um, you know, I remember when the mayor and I first met and he said, you know what, we want to be the world's most functional city. And he articulated in that vision um, a really powerful idea around active management and the value we want to create out of existing public services and how we work them as hard as possible to create as much value for the poor, the vulnerable, the disenfranchised residents of his city as was possible. Um, so, Mayor, I, I, I'd love to get you to answer two questions. The first, I, I know you talk with a, lo a lot of other mayors um, and have a good sense of sort of where this issue of longevity and well-being and our, our aging demographic sits on the priority list of your, of your fellow mayors, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Are mayors thinking about this um, a lot and in the right way, number one? And then number two, can you talk a little bit about how Helsinki is approaching these issues strategically? I think it's a well-known fact that Finland, together with Japan and South Korea, are the countries in the world which are facing the, the aging first. And that's why I think that we have been putting emphasis on this issue maybe earlier and more than, than some other places. And to be honest, I don't um, hear that many of my colleagues raising the issue of aging. They are all talking about mobility or, or smart cities or climate change or, or whatsoever. But then on the other hand, um, I don't think that we should <coughs> consider aging as a separate issue outside of all other things which are going on and happening in, in the world. Just to give you one example, uh, we are proud of maybe being one of the most walkable cities in the world. But uh, that is not a result of a consideration linked to aging. That is. A, a result of a consideration that we think that cities are there for a good life. And, and uh, then, of course, there are several components. But, uh, and what we have tried to do is, is to create a city where people walk more without deciding to walk more. Mm -hmm. And if they do that, they really contribute to their health they also contribute to the, the uh, fight against climate change, and they contribute to several other things at the same time. So what I think is, is that you need to have a comprehensive approach, uh, understand that uh, aging people are like all the other people. Uh, they are not that different. Actually, we have found out, uh, at least in our circumstances, that, that most of the population spend most of their uh, health-related services during the last uh, two years of their life, undependent on how old they live, and so on. So my, my, my point is that, yes, my colleague mayors have not maybe uh, put that much emphasis on aging, but then if you put emphasis on a good city, a functional city, a working city, you solve some of those uh, aging-related issues without actually even maybe understanding that you do it. Great. And Thanks. the same goes for public spaces. Uh, and that is something which uh, also needs a, a, a like comprehensive planning uh, 
philosophy, uh, a very comprehensive approach to, to all kind of urban, urban planning, where you at the same time, uh, when you plan some neighborhood, you take into consideration housing, uh, uh, jobs, uh, parks, uh, streets, everything schools at the same time, and try to, to build a, a city uh, which, is, which is good for everyone. One of my favorite missions is, is from the city of Copenhagen. They have an outspoken uh, mission to build a city where people spend as much time outdoors as possible. I think that we are doing more or less the same without having that as a, a I've written outspoken philosophy. Um, that's awesome. So, so and, and certainly Helsinki is a leader on climate change, on um, uh, sort of complete streets, on citizen engagement, on, on any number of those, on smartness. Um, is there a, a, coming down from the sort of strategy level to programmatic, is there an innovation or a new approach that has come from all of that that you're particularly excited about that's improving lives for seniors? Uh, several examples, certainly. Um, when I said that we may be one of the most walkable cities in the world, that is true, but at the same time, physical inactivity is a big problem for us as well. And there, uh, we have had a, a really excellent uh, cooperation with Bloomberg and the Harvard University, trying to like um, found the, the real root causes for physical inactivity concerning, for example, elderly people. And uh, of course, if you have a walkable city, it's, it's good. Uh, but but our let's say, study has led to findings like, if you don't have the social networks encouraging you to go out, if you don't feel it's safe, if you don't take care of, of the streets, cleaning the streets, especially in our circumstances where we have snow and ice uh, quite a lot of time during the year, uh, a walkable city alone is not good enough. So, I mean, we, uh, it's like psychological, behavioral issues which actually maybe mm, makes the difference. You, you need to understand why people do something or not and why, uh, uh, how they behave. And then, of course, you also need a functional uh, good city for that to take place. Then we have some other uh, innovations, of course, um, in a, a city where aging is a, a big issue. We have created a concept of virtual nursing, uh, saving more than 85% money uh, with uh, uh, our home care system where we can uh, reach uh, quite a lot of the elderly people living at their homes um, through uh, their, their tablets, uh, checking whether they have taken their medicine, whether they have um, eat, eaten and, and so on during the day. Uh, actually quite simple solutions, uh, at the same time contributing to big savings for the, the government and, and for the, the better quality of life of the elderly people. Awesome. Secretary, uh, Secretary Rodney Slater, um, next in the mix. So in addition to being a member of the advisory board here at Milken, uh, served as transportation secretary under President Clinton, uh, and is now co-chairman of transportation, shipping and logistics at Squire Patton Boggs. So um, it's great to have you here. The, we're in this period of extraordinary innovation when it comes to urban mobility with new modes of transport seemingly coming online each and every day, changing the way we live, work, play. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what should cities be doing to make streets safer and more inviting for older residents and, and anyone who has mobility issues? Well, I think um, to the degree cities can embrace uh, the power of technology uh, you can improve the capability, efficiency of your transportation system in um, innumerable ways. Um, to underscore that point, I would say that the most significant thing that probably occurred during our tenure in office on the transportation front was to make GPS available for greater civilian use. Uh, that really undergirds uh, all that's occurring in the transportation system as we move towards full automation. Uh, with the advent of 5G that you'll hear more about uh, in the coming years, you're going to see us really get to the point where the power force speed of technology 
can is truly revolutionizing the transportation experience. That's what's making mobility um, a concept for transportation. That's what uh, uh, fuels uh, Lyft and Uber and some of the other um, uh, modes of uh, uh, or means of transportation out there. Uh, it will also help us, I think, uh, to actually impact how we view cities because if you don't need, frankly, all of the parking lots, you may be able to have more parks. <laughs> and if you have more parks, then you have more of these nodes and opportunities, means for people to come together. Uh, and so I think that transportation can play a very, very important role in reshaping uh, what our cities uh, and our communities are all about. And I love uh, Dan's use of the word purpose because I think that uh, historically we probably viewed uh, transportation as the end rather than the means. Uh, and for that reason, uh, it's only natural that many of the battles uh, uh, involving equity and civil rights were actually fought around transportation concerns uh, because they were used to separate more than to connect these investments. And so you naturally had, <laughs> well, I was about to say a Montgomery bus boycott, but you naturally had a Plessy versus Ferguson, <laughs> which dealt with uh, the whole issue of separate but equal. Then Montgomery bus boycott, then the march from Selma to, uh, to um, uh, Montgomery with the Edmund Pettus Bridge and all of these transportation um, uh, surfaces used to fight these battles of equality and connection. So I think that um, a strategic, uh, visionary investment in transportation can do a lot to bring uh, our communities together. And for an aging population, uh, it, it gives more freedom <laughs> to those who might have lost uh, a step here or there but are just as sharp and as capable uh, as they've ever been. And I think this issue of automation uh, is going to help in that regard. And I think we can use the, uh, the example of what we've done uh, to serve, better serve the disability community, to actually give us insight about how you can build the political will to do what has to be done. So before I open up questions to the, the whole group, let me ask you one quick follow-on. I was really interested in sort of looking at your tenure at the Department of Transportation. To, to learn that you brought a first ever focus at the department um, to the impact of transportation systems on women and this notion of trip chaining and whether these modes and investments were working in their real lives as a means to the end of their being to fully participate in the economy and in social life. Are, are, are there lessons from that experience that you think we should be applying to this context of, 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 of growing of seniors sure well not to suggest that men don't juggle a lot of things all the time women do it all the time uh, whether it's moving the child generally to um, you know daycare or to school or whatever and then many of these movements are in the middle of the day and and it's giving them frankly the uh, a system that allows them to have these kinds of movements that allow them at the end of the day to know that they've touched all of those bases. Uh, and if you can look at it from the vantage point of the need, the purpose for all of these movements and give them the means for addressing it, then uh, that's the way we, we viewed it. And, and I'll close with this. We also argue that uh, even with uh, welfare to work, the transportation was the two in welfare to work, that it was the linchpin to get a person to where they live, to where the job opportunities are. And those opportunities could be outside of the central city if they're living in the central city or within the central city if they're living outside. And so um, again, I think if you can look at transportation more as a means rather than, a, than an end, you can start to see it much more creatively. It then becomes more than concrete asphalt and steel. It becomes the tie that binds. It becomes the bridge over troubled waters. It becomes access to opportunity. It becomes the means by which we pursue happiness. 
and I, I, I just think that that's, and I think when you view it that way, you have a better opportunity to sell it. Uh, and that's the challenge we face now because with vehicles so much more efficient, we just can't create the flow of resources necessary to fund the system as we have funded it traditionally. And so we've got to look at other means for uh, collecting the resources, maybe it's vehicle miles travel or something like that, to give us the monies we need to spend in the creative ways that we would like to spend them. Carol. Let me ask you a question. Republicans and Democrats have decided to talk about infrastructure. Today. I know. <laughs> and so do you think, in fact, they will be talking about things other than pavement and concrete and steel? What, I mean, do you, do you see that it will be a forward-leaning conversation? Well, I, I hope so. And I actually think that um, the issue of the, the Green New Deal may provide a means. Now, I don't think you can drive the discussion with that because it's a little, it's challenging in the uh, arena of debate. But what it represents uh, is very important. And transportation really is a significant um, emitter on, on the whole. And so addressing issues of clean transportation uh, can have a significant impact uh, on uh, the environment. And I would have to think that with someone like Speaker Pelosi at the table, you're going to have an issue like that um, uh, addressed. Okay, so thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks. Um, so um, across uh, all of you sort of touched back on a point around how do we make the healthy choice the easiest choice. And so um, I'd love to open that up a little bit more. Where, wh what are the policy levers that bring that to life? And where are the places where you're seeing um, cities actually doing that? Dan, do you want to start? Yes. Yeah. So uh, just to play off the transportation issue. Uh, so I wrote a cover story recently in National Geographic about the happiest places in the world. And every one of them uh, uh, involve a very walkable city. So the, the, the cities where you see the highest levels of well-being in America, and this is across ages, by the way. This is according to Gallup, which covered people of youth and people of age. Boulder, Colorado, Portland, Oregon, San Luis Obispo. In every case, uh, their transportation, their, their city engineers, their city planners, are not inducing the demand for cars. They're in inducing the demand for pedestrians and bicyclists and public transportation. They create a green belt around the city so you don't have the sprawl. So the, uh, the economic uh, uh, wealth does, isn't, isn't uh, dispersing, but it's turning inward to develop a downtown and to, to um, create mixed use and to um, uh, uh, increase the population density for so they do a lot of things that's completely counterintuitive to what every single city engineer since the Eisenhower administration has been trained to get as many cars down a street as possible that's the wrong idea if you create a street for optimal uh, automobile transit you are going to push human beings out of the way so the the, the biggest policy and uh, Finland gets it instinctively is to think about building our streets for human beings there's all kinds of policies that do that slowing speed limits down narrowing lanes when you narrow lanes people creep through increase the price of parking in downtown then people figure out other ways to 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 um, um, making a bike lane, wide, safe sidewalks for, for uh, seniors. Uh, Winston Ch Churchill once said, if you, we shape our buildings, they'll shape us. And by extension, and I've been able to see this in many of the cities I work with, if you optimize environments for human beings, culture changes. People start self-identifying as healthy. When it comes to food, there's a lot of opportunity. So let's just face it. Nobody wants to face the fact that the reason we are fat and unhealthy in this country is because we ha we our genes evolved in environments of scarcity and hardship, and we live in an environment of ease and abundance. And you can't take more than five steps without being confronted with salty snacks and sodas. And and uh, since the 1980s, the number of fast food restaurants have gone up by a factor of 30. So we know, for example, if you live in a neighborhood where there are more than six fast food restaurants within a half a kilometer of your house, you're about 30% more likely to be obese. So there are ordinances that limit the number of fast food licenses. 
if you live in a neighborhood where there are fast, where there are billboards that advertise junk food, the adjacent population is about 10% more obese than the same neighborhood where there's no. So there's, so the secret, there, you know, we we aggregated these menus. There are evidence-based menus that have worked elsewhere at uh, reducing people's access to junk food and making healthy food cheaper, uh, designing. Uh, streets for human beings and not just cars, designing spaces so you nudge people into social interaction. And uh, the secret is to systematically put those evidence-based policies in front of policymakers, in this case municipal governments I think are where the, where the action is happening these days, um, and then create this consensus. And by the way, you can't do this in a closed room. You have to invite all the stakeholders in, in the room with the decision makers and go through a consensus process. And the consensus process works like this. You take each individual policy and you ask everyone, number one, would this be effective in this community? And number two, is it feasible in this community? There's economic constraints, political constraints. And we find in every community, eight to 10 to 12 policies are no brainers. Yes, it'd be easy to do the two. Yes, we can get it done in three years. Yes, it'd make a huge difference. So it's that systematic focus. And this is, it all boils down to this. The happiest cities in the world, when I say happy, they have the highest level of, of um, life satisfaction. That's the, the metric. Or uh, high positive affect, low negative. It is never a coincidence. In every case, 50 to 100 years ago, there were leaders like Jan who made this proactive effort to aggregate quality of life policies. Mm -hmm. Educate, making sure every kid is educated, making sure women especially, educated women yield, educated mothers who have fewer children, healthier children, more educated children who grow up to make better voting decisions, taking the focus off of, of trying to mitigate sickness and keep people healthy in the first place. Public health, I think we're probably really aligned on that. Um, and then, quite honestly, and this is an inconvenient message, I know, but the, the two biggest correlates to well-being at an international level are trust. Do I trust my neighbor? Do I trust my politicians? And two, equality. Finland is very good at that, and it's probably one of the reasons it's the happiest country in the world right now. The ladder between rich and poor is low. A dollar in the hand of Rupert Murdoch is worth a heck of a lot less than it is in the, in the, in the hand of a single mother. So it's... Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying stifle business, but I am saying there's a strong correlation between equality and well-being of populations. Anybody else want to take a shot at that? I'd just offer one thing quickly. Um, I think that you can actually have older cities that can um, re-engineer. I'd use Boston as an example, if I may. Uh, the Big Dig project that got a lot of attention, I mean, basically what they did was they tore down an interstate was, that was separating the city, and they built tunnels and they submerged and they, and they opened green Great example. space. Exactly. Mayor Menino, a mayor at the center of it. Another example, I think, is, um, is actually uh, San Francisco after Parker it was, uh, that's right, and where Mayor Brown said, we will not rebuild that monstrosity. Now we, because we were in government at the time, had to figure out, okay, how do you deal with the transportation issues, challenges. But creative minds got together, we figured it out, and if you uh, go to that area now, it's just beautiful. All of that use of the bay and the, you know, the piers and just beautiful. And you can still move. And there's a lot more walking, uh, a lot more green there. But, but those people are melt older it down cities. with the notion, oh, you're taking the freeway away. I know. <laughs> we will never be able to, we, we can't handle these problems. And it turns out it was <laughs> completely counterintuitive. Exactly. And a hugely positive outcome. Exactly. Dan inspired me actually to underline the importance of showing that you care. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And in Helsinki, we have been able to reduce costs for healthcare concerning aging people, despite of the fact of the increasing number of that, because we heavily prioritized home care. And we have quite good results. Uh, during 10 years, we have been able to raise the share of, of people uh, with the age of 85 plus from 70 to 80 staying still at home. 
uh, which is of course a, a part of quality of life. Everyone wants to stay at home as, as long as possible. But of course, in, in order to make that happen, we have been uh, forced to, to like uh, put quite a lot of resources and energy on, on the home care system itself. And we have a, a quite comprehensive system all the way from 24-7 contact centers for all our home care clients to, to case managers for those who need a more comprehensive set up of, of different kind of services. And then one of our recent uh, innovations, which I'm really proud of uh, and glad of, is that we put together youth and elderly uh, housing in a way that uh, we heavily subsidize the rent for the youth on the condition that they just spend some hours a week working with the, the elderly people. Because in our system, it's, it's a little bit maybe even the opposite from the states where you have seen that there is an increase in a multi-generational uh, housing. In, in our country, it's more a question of, of too many people living alone, uh, feeling loneliness as they may be biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. And there we need to find that kind of innovative solutions. And actually the outcome has been excellent. And even the youth, they, they really appreciate the, the, the opportunity and possibility to spend some time together with elderly people. So I, I, I listened to the, um, and I'd love, we'll see if we have time for one or two questions from the audience, so if you have them, form them now. Um, but I listened to the outcomes that you're talking about, and I think to my, I'm thinking about Mayor Greg Fisher in Louisville, you know, who, who wants to create the kindest city in the country, and I think mayors are thinking more and more about well-being and about connected communities. Um, you know, is the pace of change that we're seeing ambitious enough? And if not, is it a knowledge challenge? Is it an implementation and technical problem? Is it a political and a resource issue? I know Carol um, thinks about resources a lot in the context of civic spaces, but why, aren't, why isn't it moving more quickly? Or do we believe it's moving at the right pace? Oh, absolutely not. And, and I think it's a political and narrative challenge. I mean, I was thinking you make change sound so clean, we're gonna get consensus and we're gonna get all the stakeholders. Generally speaking, my experience is no, you're not. Because people don't know what they don't know. They only know what they've seen. They only know what they know. So they only know what they're told. And I really think it, it requires leadership. You talked about Mayor Brown. Um, you know, you talked about Mayor Menino. These are guys who really had a lot of political clout, stability, time in office, and well, then you're mayor. and you know, I'm not sure if you'd put either of those projects to a vote, you would have won the vote. Mm -hmm. So I think it's this you know, leadership still matters. And, and creating, I mean, you mentioned, for instance, Boulder, rarefied air, you know, like. I don't agree. Mm, okay. Uh, they're, they're, we I, having spent a, a year there um, and studying it, it was, it was deliberate, it was uh, stakeholders coming together around policies that favored quality of life. It was very, it wasn't just because a bunch of money descended. It, no. it was a good place that was well run and with the right priorities that drew the Googles and the big companies that are making it a rarefied air. Well, uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, when you have a predominantly college town, uh, that has then, because of that knowledge base, has attracted those companies. I'm simply saying it's a very different uh, proposition than in uh, middle America. So, so again, I love it when, that, when it works that way. I'm just simply saying, we need to create to increase the pace of change. I think we have to normalize the change we're seeking, and more examples, uh, more powerful stories. I mean, generally people aren't convinced by facts and rationale. They're convinced by I want that, right? It's something. It's something that draws me to it. I want that, or it either it's either pushing me off the ledge, right? Because there's an emergency, the earthquake. Right now, we have to do something, or it's something that is so enticing that it becomes easy to sell. So I don't know. I, I think narrative matters. Narrative. Yes, um, Finland is actually organizing a, a, a 
big uh, global conference called Silver Economy Forum uh, in July uh, under the umbrella of our EU presidency together with, uh, in the partnership with Global Coalition of on, on Aging. And they uh, used to say that uh, the organizers that gray is, is the next green. Uh, whether it's, mm. it's fair to say or not, uh, there are that many differences, but I think what is similar <laughs> is that it is an issue which is there, and we like more or less know it is there, but because we don't see any really clear evidence or concrete consequences just now, we have not been ambitious enough yet. Uh, and there, uh, I think, th there is actually quite a lot of similarities there. Uh, but then I think something which will become a game changer is what is an issue which we haven't discussed that much yet is that uh, the aging also leads to a situation where a much, much bigger part of all voters are senior <laughs> citizens. And they will most probably have somehow different voting patterns. And at least in my country and in Europe, older citizens, they also are much more probable to vote than the younger ones. And that will, I mean, quite soon may have a big impact on all democracies all around the world, where the older people all of a sudden take over and they demand things which we should have been doing already for, for a time. But that, I think it cuts both ways because they, older voters can also um, hang on to what they know even though that actually may not be the best way to live. I mean, if you've ever had to take a car away from an aging parent, so, um, uh, it's, it, you know, that is very painful. And so, um, is, but you're right, and especially in local elections, young people do not vote. Uh, we did a survey at night looking at communities across the country at the local voting patterns. Interestingly, no one had done the work. And, uh, you know, if you think they're useless in national elections, just look at a local election. I mean, young people just don't vote. No, they don't. Yeah. Uh, any burning questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I just want to come back on inequality, something I know you all care about, but uh, wasn't uh, discussed deeply. I, I was glad to hear it brought up. By some estimates uh, in the United States, 20 percent or more of people entering the age of 65 will live in poverty. Uh, is that just beyond, is economic poverty just beyond what cities can do? And so you have to need to focus on these other kind of structural built issues. Is that really a national economy issue? Or is there something cities can do about economic poverty? Uh, can I take uh, just one quick shot? Because I think uh, cities have a huge role to play in this. I mean, if um, and you talked about, uh, I think, ensuing rather than pursuing. And I think when we have, uh, we know from Raj Chetty's work that where you live matters, right? And, and we are, although all the talks about gentrification uh, in terms of place uh, making in America, in fact, we have far more disinvested neighborhoods today than we did uh, 40 years ago. That's where the huge increases have come. So, so what we found out, right, is that when we have tried, when we have forced, uh, when we have pursued uh, economic integration, we, um, we've been amazingly um, unsuccessful, right? We tried to integrate schools and then now we're more segregated than that. You know, we've done all sorts of things, pursued housing. So, so one of the things I think that cities can do is pay a lot of attention, and you're doing this, pay a lot of attention to how you mix it up in terms of either where people live or if you can't get there, which is ambitious, and some cities won't go there, then where they socialize, which is part of the... And if, if out of that socialization, people actually create social networks, right, because that's key to opportunity, then you have at least some uh, basis for uh, moving up the ladder. But it's all about, I think, this creation of social networks. Again, that's not only good for uh, longevity, it's good for economic opportunity and so many other things. Great. One more quick question, and we're going to wrap. Quick, then. <coughs> uh, I just wanted to comment on the, on the last uh, questioner's point that 
I think the challenge and the importance of the things you're talking about in, of engaging uh, our elders in community is that in the future, because of education, when it comes to in the U.S., the boomer cohort, they won't start in poverty, but we may force them to end in poverty. Because the largest cohort, because of the increase in education, is going to be middle-income boomers. They'll be the largest senior cohort. But if we don't do the very things you all are talking about, they'll all end up forced to spend down and in poverty. And so that, to me, is actually one of the greatest urgency reasons for the issues, th for doing the things in cities that you're talking about. It's not that we're going to have this huge group of poor elders. Actually, education has made enormous impact. It's where it's our are we if we don't meet their needs, they will end their lives in poverty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not a question. Not a question, <laughs> but uh, uh -huh. ma'am, would anybody like to respond? If not, um, amen. Uh, amen. <laughs> Thank you. What a great uh, final thought for us to close on. Please uh, join me in uh, thanking our very distinguished panel Thank you so much. for a great conversation. Thank you for being here. Thanks.